involved today, hot and sweaty, raring to go. I like the hot weather. I'm a bit unique and different. I like the hot weather and, and uh, when the Lord sends us down to Melbourne or Adelaide or down south, which he's going to do this year again, um, I go, oh Lord. But he always reassures me, he says, I'm going to be with you and don't forget that jumper and that parker and that underwear that's thermal that you can take with you. So I really like the hot weather. But this morning we're going to be looking at the book of Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to be seeing what we can glean from there. There's always something, isn't there? Always something. Sometimes, you know, you know I've read the, the word of God through, oh gosh, heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of, heaps of times in these 28 years. And sometimes we do go through lulls where we go, oh, I know that, I know that. And sometimes you go a little bit like, oh, I wish there was something that just, just hits you and slaps you in the face. But you know, a lot of that is our own responsibility. We have to ask and come before God and say, Lord, just bring it to life again. Bring it to life again. Bring it fresh to my, fresh to my ears and fresh to my mind, fresh to my heart. So you go to a different version. We go to the Amplified or we go to the New Living or we go to some other version and then you realize, whoa, this is something. Wow, I'm gleaning something else out of that. So whether you've read this or whether you haven't, we're going to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. We're going to be starting at Paul talking. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Three insights stand out for me. You may have just read through that or heard me read that or I don't know if it's on screen. It's not because I was naughty and didn't say, can you put it up on the screen for me? But you know, you may glean something totally else out of it and that's good because God meets us exactly where we are and gives us exactly what we need at any specific time we just heard Pastor Marilyn said what did you get out of John and we heard several different things that people got out of John awesome we're on different paths we're not all the same but God is the same God and he gives us exactly what we need, when we need it, to get us through any situation or circumstance. Amen. Now, I know you're hot and you're bothered, but I do want you to get a little bit excited here today. I can see some people like going, yeah, and other people are going, oh, it's just too much. It's too hot. Crack out the fans a bit more. First thing, Paul wants, Paul wants to know Christ Jesus. He has a, a desire to know Jesus. He wants desperately to know Jesus. How's that sitting with you? Have you known Jesus? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I just feel like Marilyn Monroe then. <laughs> he says in the Amplified Version, For my determined purpose is that I may know him, perceiving him, recognizing him and the understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. Doesn't that tell you something about Paul's attitude and character? He's not a complacent Christian. He's not somebody who's just sitting back in his lounge chair going, yeah, bring it on. He says, I want to understand. I want to perceive. I want to get to know this person who loves me so much. And so I look into this and I go, Paul loves right back. Because he was first loved, Paul loves him right back. We've, you know, we've got to come back to the basics 
quite often. Don't take God for granted. Don't take what he did for granted by sending his only son to die for us, for you, for your sins, for my sins. Don't take him for granted, but love on him back. If you're feeling dry, well, perhaps you need to love and acknowledge and be thankful, as Paul said, about what he's actually done and fan into flame that love once again. I find by just sitting back, it doesn't do anything. I have to be proactive in my walk with Jesus all the time. Because if I'm not, do you know something? The devil will certainly come along and he'll fill my life with other stuff. And usually it's stuff that I quite like. It's pleasurable to sit on my backside, not get up early, not necessarily you know, study the scriptures to glean, to da 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 It can be sometimes pleasurable because the day has already begun and I've got to get into it. But I tell you, I remember it clear as a bell when, I, when our girls were younger. They knew when I didn't get into the word of God. I was a grumpy mummy. <laughs> I was a grumpy mummy. And I had to keep coming back to, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I never want to lose that love. Just like I don't want to lose the love of my husband. I put effort into our relationship, as does he with me. In, the, in the, the Matthew 24, it says, In the last days, the love of most will die. Grow cold. Some say, will wax cold. Notice it doesn't say many. I, I thought that was interesting. It said most. The love of most will grow cold in the last days. That scares me. It concerns me. Because as I look around, I don't want your love to grow cold for the Lord. Because it only ends badly for you. Then and now. In the book of Ephesians, uh, sorry, in, in the book of Revelation, the, the, the Ephesians, the church of Ephesus, one of the things that the Lord held against them was they had forsaken their first love. And strangely enough, in the, in the church of Laodicea, they were told, I would rather you be hot or cold Pastor Marilyn said it. But if you're lukewarm, God says, I'm going to spew you, spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. Do you feel slapped yet? <laughs> when I, look, I tell you, when I was preparing this message, I went, oh my goodness. Seriously, Lord? <laughs> Seriously? I was coming here in fear and trembling. <laughs> And I know you guys love me. Right? Amen, 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 amen. Yeah. <laughs> Even our daughter sent several encouraging texts. <laughs> she did. It's so cool when, you, when your daughters just send texts. It's going to be fine, Mum. You're going to do well. God's with you. He's on the throne. Although she did wake up. She says, if you fail, Mum, it's meant for a reason. It's going to teach me something. And I said, I'm not holding on to that because I know God's got this. He's in control. Amen. It doesn't matter what look God gives us, whether we feel like, oh, this is such a heavy message or we're being slapped around. It's for our growth. It's to grow us up. And don't forget, he gave this to me first. So I had to analyze myself and do some searching in myself before I can bring it to you. Paul says, I want to know Christ Jesus. This is a warning. Let's be the greatest lovers, not just of people, but of the Lord. Because the real love, true love, only comes through him, by him. Secondly, Paul puts the past in its place. And we're going to dwell here a little bit. He says, forgetting what is behind... How many of us are hanging on to stuff in the past? And I want you to be aware that when we were doing worship, that was the past. Five minutes ago, that was the past. 
You can't get it back. You can't change it. It's done. It's dusted. Paul puts the past in its place, forgetting what is behind, he says. I push on. He understood that if he was going to understand all that there was about the resurrection, about Jesus, he couldn't be looking back. He had to forget. And notice it doesn't say, I forgot what's behind. I forgot the past. He says, I'm forgetting. It's a process. It's something some people can forget just like that. Other people it takes a long time. And it's all okay. We're all on the journey. God's with us and he just gently guides us. But we have to be aware of his guidance and do as he tells us to do when he tells us to do it. I look at Paul. This is a guy who had a terrible past. I mean, I don't think if I went around to every single one of you, no one would come as close to Paul. He would have, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had an encounter. His name was Saul back then. He was a guy who hunted and killed Christians. He sought them out. He hated them. Could you imagine meeting Jesus on that road to Damascus? And Jesus says, Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? And he had an encounter which transformed and changed his life forever. But then he had a responsibility. Do I dwell in the past and going, oh, oh, look what I've done. I can't get over, I can't go on answering the call of God on my life. He would be saying, I can't go on, I can't go on answering the call of God on my life. Because of look what I've done, look what I've done. He didn't do that. We can see it clear as a bell. He didn't do that. He states, forgetting what's in the past. Forgetting. I can't do anything about it, he's saying. I can't change it. It is what it is. But I can change the now. I can change the now. We all have a past and the past shapes who we are. But it does not define us. It does not define who we are. It does not define our future. Only our choices now on our walk with Jesus defines us. When we come into relationship with Jesus, something miraculous happens. You may have given your life to Jesus. I suspect many of you have. Some of you may not have. But something happens when we give our life to Jesus Christ. Something miraculous if we allow it to. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. Something happens. When we give our life to Jesus, when we open ourselves up, when we surrender to his will and his ways, when we acknowledge what he's done on the cross and, and the resurrection, something miraculous happens. We're told the old is gone, the new has come. The new. And Paul took that. He took that and he ran with it. He says, I can move on. He was given a new name. He was Saul. He became Paul. Very interesting. He ran with it. He says, that guy saw, that's not me now. That's not me now. Oh my goodness, if only you knew me 30 years ago. Oh, <laughs> you would not have even probably talked to me. Not that I was a bad person, but I was a little odd. <laughs> and out there, Eric loved the oddness. He loved it when I wore my T-shirts and there was big holes in them. 
He loved that I wore one earring and my hair up like this, like a crazy woman. He loved that I was living on the edge, just going for life. But we were meant to be. Paul became a new creation as I became a new creation. The old Olga was gone. She still wants to come back sometimes. And sometimes I let her. If it's the good Olga, if it's in line with God's ways, it's okay. But I can tell you, the old Olga is dead, gone. The new Olga is here to stay. Because I like what I have become and what I am becoming. Why, you might say, that's a strange thing to say. I'm growing in the image of Christ, I believe. I love people more than what I ever have. I'm becoming more patient. His characteristics are rubbing off on me and it blesses my life. And it blesses the life of my husband and my family. When we are in Christ Jesus, we become new creatures or creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So if you're still living in the past, have the mindset of change. I'm not looking back anymore. But why do we go back? Why do we look back? I have four little points. So the one, first one is attention. Attention. Sometimes it's we look back and we go, oh, look what I've gone through. Look what I've had to put up with. This and that happened to me. And we look back. Because sometimes we actually get the hearing of people who go, oh, really? That's so sad. And oh, I'm so sorry for you. And oh, and we get the attention. We get the attention. I'm speaking from my own life. Do not think for one moment that I'm pointing the finger at anyone here today. And if everybody's honest, they can all say that we have tried to gain attention in some way, shape or form by coming back and telling some gloomy story of our past. But that's victim mentality. And there is no victims in the kingdom. There are only victors. Jesus overcame sin and death. We have the victory through him. So let's not play the victim anymore if we are today i look at verse uh, number two unforgiveness we look to the past because of unforgiveness in our own life i have the, had the opportunity to look back at my past so many times that people who have mistreated me said something wrong done something wrong stolen just horrible my uncle my goodness it took me uh, maybe a month in coming to know jesus when my uncle was, he's a good man, don't get me wrong, he's a good man, and he goes to church and he follows Jesus, and, but we all have weaknesses and God chips away. And he can tend to be a very hard man and sometimes br brutal with his vocabulary at what he says to you. It can be quite demeaning. What he, and I'm talking about years ago, I was not a Christian. And at the age of 16, 17, I was about to go on a world trip or a trip. And uh, he spoke so much down to me that I remember being in tears in front of my family. And then running into the bedroom, as you do, and saying to my, my aunt, How can he call himself a Christian? He's just mean. I never want to be a Christian if that's what it is all about. Never. Do you know I carried that? I carried that for a few years. I, I went as far to say I hate him. I hate his guts. Unsaved, volatile woman, girl. I hate him. I don't care if I ever see him again. He treated me like something under his shoe. I came into relationship with Jesus one month not even probably one month, and Jesus called me on it. As you forgive, that forgiveness will be given to you. 
And I thought, I'm right, who, who, who aren't I forgiving? And uncle came to mind. The ball was in my court. But I was a changed creation. The old Olga had gone. The new had come. But the old Olga still was there going, well, it was his fault. But the Spirit of God was saying, do what is right and all will go well with you. I sent him a letter. I prayed. I asked for forgiveness for the angst that I was feeling against him. I never got a reply for six months. And then when I did, he said, I don't know what you're on about. I don't know what you're on about. Strangely enough, 20 years later, I came into his presence, around about 20 years, and he actually brought it up and said, what was all that about? And I said, I'd forgotten about that. I had forgotten, as Paul says, forgetting what is behind, done, dusted, dealt with, done, gone. I feel nothing of angst towards him anymore after that letter was sent and I received his reply because it was not on me anymore. It was on him. Unforgiveness though. Oh, friends, you've probably heard it a million times. But don't keep it within your life because it will tear you apart. It will drag you down. It will cause you to get ill. It's just not good. It's not good for you. Thirdly, going through a tough time and looking back at the better times. Have you ever done that? When you're going through a tough time, you look back into the past and you, go, you snatch things of the good times. Oh, I hear people saying, I remember, I remember when butter was 70 cents a pound. <laughs> I remember that. And petrol, well, that was 20 cents a litre. And that's me talking. <laughs> I remember those days when it was about 70 cents a pound of butter. It's 500 grams now, right? Now it's $5. Now it's $5 a pound. And you're thinking, what's that got to do with a slice of bread? Well, bread's gone up too. <laughs> it's gone up too. And I think some people, they look back to the glory days. Look at the Israelites. Look at the Israelites. Magnificent adventure a, 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 a example. And they're on an adventure of their life. They're in the desert. They're wandering around. They're hungry for what they want. And they said to dear old Moses and Aaron, and they says, Oh, woe is us. We wish the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. At least we had pots of meat to eat there. And our bellies were full. Oh, woe is us. They were looking back. And as I was reading that, just, just yesterday or the, the other day, I thought, you silly people, you were slaves. They focused in on the good things. And don't we always do that? We want to go back sometimes because we remember the good, but we forget the bad. And I actually see that a lot in domestic violence. Just putting it out there. They remembered they're good, but they forgot that they were slaves in that land. Fourth, feelings of guilt can drag us back, can send us back into the past. You've done something wrong. You've done something wrong. And you can't change it. And I could rattle off a whole list of things, but I don't want to get into it. You've done something wrong. And now you have to go on through life. Look at Paul. He did the same thing. But as Paul did, he understood that if we ask for forgiveness, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He puts our transgressions as far as his, the east is from the west. He's thinking when we go, oh, but... I can't, surely I can't go on and answer that call or surely I can't come and minister with that person because I, got, I did that to that person. And he's saying, what are you talking about? I can't remember that. That's done and dusted. Dealt with. Let's move on. If anything, the devil's sort of saying, 
Oh, remember when you did that? You are so undeserved. You are so undeserved. Who do you think you are that you could answer the call? Who do you think that you could minister into that person's life? And God's just saying, oh, be quiet. Listen to me and my small voice. Get into the scriptures and know the truth that will truly set you free. Truly set you free. How do I know that I'm living in the past? How do you know you're living in the past? Well, you just can't stop talking about it. You just can't stop talking about it. And when we stepped out in 1999 on the road, we felt forsaken by people. We had a core group of people that was loving on us when we were in their faces. We stepped out and lo and behold, we never heard a word from them. Not a word. It was like, who? Aussie bar, who? I'll go, Eric, who? And I got hurt. And so I look back in the past, but what about that? that relate? What about that relation? What about? And they said, and, and you know, everybody I came across, I'd say, they'd say, oh, and what church supports you? Oh, actually, we're hoping, we're hoping that they pray for us, but let me tell you, we haven't heard anything from anybody. And it's been six months. One pastor said, get a grip, move on. He did. And I was so offended by that. You don't know what I've been going through all alone with two children in a caravan. See, I know about looking back. I know about human emotion. And that's the second point. How do we know we're living in the past? Is because when we think about it, or when we speak about it, it evokes an emotion. And it's usually anger or sadness. Anger or sadness. It's time to deal with the past. Paul says, I put the past in its place. I'm forgetting what is behind. He didn't have to deal with it. He didn't want to deal with it. He knew what went on. He knew God knew what went on. It was done. It was dusted. And he was used mightily for the kingdom of God. As godly men and women, we need to keep our mouths and our minds in line with Christ. We need to. The battle belongs in, it's in the mind. It begins in the mind. We've got to get a handle on what's going on in our mind. Cast out those thoughts that will drag you down. Cast out those thoughts that will pull you into the past. And by just don't go there and speak it. Because once it's out, you can never take it back. And I know that by me whinging about the past, I may have done damage. Not only with the people that I was speaking to, because it was not a good example, but also it's out there in the spiritual realm. It's just out there. Philippians 4, verse 8. Awesome bit of scripture. One of my faves. Where are you? What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Nope. That's not it, because I'm in three. I need to go to four. Finally, brothers, this is the one. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. Pure, praiseworthy, Excellent, lovely, righteous, noble. Think about those things. There's enough stuff in the world, enough negativity in the world to drag you down without listening to that, going into the past, pulling you down. Think on those things which are good. Don't look back. In fact, it would be interesting if I did a silent survey and said, how many of you are looking back right now? I remember last time I came here, we were talk I had a word about failure. 
And I believe that there are some here today who there is something in your life that you continually go back to. It's like a niggle in your side that's not dealt with. Today is dealing time. Don't look back. In the book of uh, Luke 9, somebody came up to Jesus and he says, 961 if you're taking notes, somebody came up to Jesus and said, Lord, Jesus, I will follow you, but let me first go back and say goodbye to my family. It seems like an okay request, right? But Jesus is hardcore because he sees the heart of the person. And he turned around and said, anyone, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Anyone who puts his hand to the plow. Now, have we all seen the old plows where they had the bullock team and you, you had to hang on to it and you, you just you keep your eye focused on the horizon and you just plow that field in a straight line? If you turn around, that plow is going to go everywhere. It's going to go absolutely everywhere. And you're, that, that farmer's field is going to be useless for raising a crop, for reaping a harvest. I mow the lawns. You've got a zero-point mower. I'd like to check it out. <laughs> See if mine's better than yours. <laughs> I know mine's a big one, and it's red. <laughs> And I get on that mower, and Eric just, I mean, I, it blew, it threw, it's two hand. Well, I can't sort of do this. <laughs> but I'm on it the other day, and I was thinking about this, and I'm like, yeah, what if I was looking behind? And there's like gardens and everything. What if I was looking behind? And I just sort of like, and I found my hand going like this, and I started to turn, going for a tree. Oh, don't do that. Bring it back. Keep your eye on the horizon where you've got to go. Keep your eye where you're going forward. Don't look back. I had an interesting, funny experience many years ago with Nikita when we were teaching her how to ride a bike down the Gold Coast. And of course, as good parents, you buy the bike extra, extra large so that they can grow into it, right? So, so Nikki was like on, on her tippy toes riding this bike on the Gold Coast. We were, we were going from Talabudja Caravan Park to Tweed Heads. So it's a fair distance. 20 k's, not far, and she's going through and she's riding this bike. Now, okay, some of you are going, what a bad mother, bad mother. It's on you, not on me. Nikki was, Nikki was riding a bike and she turned around and she says, Mom, how am I doing? And she went straight into a fence, straight into a fence. Well, I actually, I started to get the giggle straight up and then I realised, oh, she's just hit the fence. I, be, I should, really should not be like, come on, you can understand, you can understand. It was... I'm a visual person when my dad, yeah, see, I told you I'm not perfect, all right? She was all right, she was all right, but I learned a big lesson, and so did she. Don't look backwards when you're on a bike. Don't, if you're in a car, please don't look behind you with your head. Look forward, look forward. Jesus says, follow me, does he not? I've got two people who believe that Jesus says, follow me. Follow me, follow me, he says. And if you're following someone, you can't look behind, can you? All right, get up. Off your seats, come on. No, you're going to just stand up. And I want everybody to look behind you. Just look behind you. Don't look forward. I'm having a real party up here. I'm having a great time. Oh, Jesus, you're doing great things up here. Up, oh, you looked around. Do you get what I'm saying? You can't see. You're not part of the party up here. You're not part of what Jesus is doing up here. I'm having a great time. You're too busy looking backwards. You're too busy looking behind you. And that's what happens when you look behind. You're stunted. Your growth is stunted. You don't move on. You're just there. Or you're going backwards to a past that you can't change. You can be seated. Remember that example. Or the mower. Or the bike. Thirdly, Paul presses on toward the goal. He presses on. It was significant words he uses. And there he's saying, keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going to fight the good fight. I'm going to keep going. He says in verse 12, he's pressing on to take hold. Verse 13 says, 
a strains to what's ahead. Verse 14 says, he presses on toward the goal. It's a labor at times. Can I tell you? I heard somebody said to me one time, they said, Christians are, are wimps. You need a crutch. And I just looked at them and I said, you've got to be kidding. I don't know any wimps in the, the Christian circle, in church. I don't know any wimps in God. I don't know any pussies. I only know tenacious, fearless warriors who are serving Jesus Christ, who aren't looking back, who are loving on him and ca not counting the cost. We just say, yes, Lord. We know you got the cost. You, bought the, you paid the price. We know it. We're just going forward. We're just going forward. And so was Paul. I'm pressing on toward the goal which God has called me to. It's not always easy, though, to get up and face the day when you don't know what the day holds. It's unknown. It's unknown. And if you've gone through a tough time to face another day, sometimes it's just like, I can't do this. I actually don't want to do this. But that's where we get back to the Word of God. We've got to learn to get into the Word. Matthew 6 31 to 34 says, Do not worry about what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. Don't worry about these things. The pagans run after those things, and God knows your needs. This is the word of God I'm speaking. He knows your needs. But seek first what? The kingdom of God. And all these things shall be given to you. All these things shall be given to you. All. But so many people today, they say, well, I'm not getting married until I get to this financial point. I'm not going to have children until I have this, that and the other. I'm not going to... It's like, what are you doing? Seriously? I understand being wise. But don't put emphasis on what you're going to have, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. God knows your needs. By you acting out and doing everything else, you're actually saying to Father God, you're not in control. I got this. I got this. Do you know how wonderful it is to be needed? I love being needed by my girls. And by my husband. Sometimes. <laughs> Did you hear that? He said, I need you, dear. And I need him right back. But God wants to feel needed as well because it's inclusive. You think, I don't want to bother God. God's big enough to handle your concerns. My goodness. Philippians 1 says, 1 verse 6 says, He who began a good work in you will carry it into completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So it doesn't matter what day you're facing, what moment in time you're facing. God has started a good thing in you. And that good thing in you assures you that you can face whatever that day brings. Whatever. What absolute ever. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. He has promised that he will be our guide. In fact, when I was preparing this, oh, my, my mind was mud. I went over this and I write, write out my messages. I'm old school and I highlight with hi highlighter because I'm a little bit different. But I went over and over and over and nothing was sitting. Could you tell? Nothing was sitting. And I sat on the bed in our bedroom up at Childers, because that's where I do my messages. I know it's weird, but I'm not professional. And I sat there and I said, Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, manifest yourself and come out with your power as I deliver this message. 
He started a good work in me. He started a good work in you. He dwells within you and there is nothing that you can't do if God calls you to do it. The only thing that will stop you, and hear this, the only thing that will stop you is you. If God calls you, he will equip you, he has anointed you, and you will bring it into completion because of the good work that God is doing in your life. But I don't see the good work in my life. Well, you know you. God knows the you that you're becoming. It's a faith journey. Jeremiah 29 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. A future. Not a past. A future. I mean, Brian Houston says, The best is yet to come. 54 years old, 55 this year, and the best is yet to come. Eric says, do you think we've got a time frame? No, I'll still be preaching at 88. I might need a <laughs> bit of a... <laughs> but I'll be poking my walking stick, maybe. Who knows? The best is yet to come. These scriptures should boost us, should, should do something and if, if I've read them too fast, go home. Read them yourself. I'm sure they're taping this message. Listen to it again. First Peter, last bit, bit of scripture for your encouragement and my encouragement. First Peter 1, 3 and 4. This is hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept inheritance for you. Paul's tenacity came from the fact that there's an inheritance, that he had a hope of a future, that he knew he wasn't alone on the journey, that he had one who was with him all the time. Do you know that you are not alone? You have, may have lost a loved one, but you're not alone. Except for my brother whose wife's in. No, you're still not alone. <laughs> Vietnam. He's not alone. He's feeling the loneliness because his wife's away overseas, but he's not alone. The Lord's right by his side. You just don't get bacon and eggs. You have to make it yourself, which is okay. Paul, in this little bit of scripture, has given us some true insights into victory living. Remember Lot's wife. She was called out of an evil place. She was on her way into freedom, into safety. And what did she do? She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Let's not be people who look back. Don't be glory day people. Be now people. Be futuristic people. Be visionaries for the cause of Christ. For there's no future in looking back. Amen. Let's be great lovers. Fan into flame that love that you have for Christ or had for Christ. Don't take him for granted because he loves you. Don't abuse his love. Love him back. Be thankful, as Paul says. Don't become lukewarm, as Pastor Marilyn said. Don't forsake your first love. Look forward. Plow that field in a straight line. Keep your eyes fixed on the horizon where Jesus is saying, come on, follow me. Follow me. And no matter what, press on. Press on towards for it's only when you do that that you will really attain the goal that you so seek. It's waiting for you in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, your glorious word. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are good. We were encouraged today to be thankful. Well, I'm thankful, Lord God, that you are a miracle working God, a mighty God. We are thankful that we have the privilege of serving you, Lord. I pray that as people have come in one way, that they would walk out, Father God, totally changed with a, with a desire in their hearts and their bellies to serve you, to move forward with you, that there would be a tenacity which is growing within them that fans into flame that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God's, your, your power is made perfect, Father God, in our weakness. I pray, Lord God, that we would hear your voice and your voice alone that we wouldn't listen to the lies of the, the devil, the enemy, that, Father God, we would be true overcomers. As Paul overcame so many things, he wrote that bit of scripture while he was in prison. My goodness. He had every reason to be downheartened, downcast, feeling miserable. But no, not Paul. He had his eyes fixed on the prize, carried by your love. No turning back. No turning back. Friends, today, I don't know where you are at in your walk with the Lord. I have no idea. But I know God loves you so, so much. And the thing that hurts him the most is when we turn away from him and try and take control back of our own lives, not because he's a domineering God, but because he wants to be part of your lives. So today I'm going to give you opportunity. If you have never given your life to Jesus, or if you would like to recommit your life to Jesus today, I'm going to get you to just raise your hand. If that's you, is there anybody here who would like to give your life to Jesus afresh or recommit your life to Jesus? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand real high. Praise God. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? You're all right with Jesus. You're fine. The relationship's going great. Is it? Do you love on him the way that you should? Do you pray? One last time, if you would like to recommit your life to Jesus, just raise your hand where you sit. Praise God. Anybody else? If we don't acknowledge, one thing I've learned over the years, if we do not acknowledge where we're at, he cannot work in your life. You can put your hand down. Anybody else before I pray? Father, I thank you for those hands that were raised. Lord God, you are a miracle working God. You are the only true God who comes to live and dwell in us through the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father God, that as Saul met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, that these hands, these people, these beautiful children of yours would have an encounter. They've had a, a taste. They've had an encounter. But, Lord, I pray that you would bring that to, for them in such a place that it would be a total transformation, that the old is truly gone. It's, been, it's gone. It's in the past. That they walk out of here knowing that they are a new creation that the future is good for them, that it holds blessing and strength and purpose and goodness all the days of their lives. I thank you, Father, for your word. And I know that there are people here who struggle sometimes in their faith walk. I'm here to tell you that you may be doubting some things of God because you haven't seen him work recently he's on the job your eyes just have not been not opened yet he doesn't want you to see because we walk by faith and not by sight be assured he's on the job and in the perfect timing of God and his timing only you will see what he's been working at all this time and it will bring you great joy so until that day keep the faith fight the good fight 
run the race like you've never run it before and know that you are truly, truly, abundantly, unconditionally loved in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like prayer after the service, I'm going to be hanging around up the front. I want to stand with you and believe for great things. Amen. Amen.